I am very, very excited to introduce to you a colleague of mine. His name is Tim Harrison. Tim has been serving with Friends of Israel for decades. He's a graduate of the Institute of Jewish Studies. He is a specialist. You, you, you got to get this. So he's already got a background in Jewish studies, but he's a specialist in hieroglyph, hieroglyph I can't even say it, hieroglyphics. And he does church history as a specialist in church history. And if you really want to get a, you know, peak his interest, he loves model trains. So <laughs> I'm going to give it over to Tim Harrison. Tim, take it away, my friend. Hey, guys. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me well. And uh, I am just so happy and thrilled to be here. Uh, I love it because every one of you that's here wants to be here. And how exciting is that for a history geek like me? Uh, so, uh, and, you know, history is definitely one of my passions, as Chris said. And one of my burdens for with history is making it palatable, palatable uh, for every person and making it fun. So we're going to have some fun tonight. Uh, that's going to make it memorable, going to make it uh, so that we can carry some things with us. So I want this to be fun. I want it to be a good time. Uh, and I want the uh, I want us all to be blessed by it. And uh, Lord willing, uh, that's what's going to happen. Um, as you can see, our title is part one of this church uh, history lesson is going to be Athanasius against the world. I don't know if any of you ever heard the term Athanasius contra mundum. But this is where it comes from, and it means Athanasius against the world. So we're going to be talking about a guy named Athanasius. Um, uh, so, Chris, if you could go to the next slide. Yeah, what, and we're going to find some things out here uh, as we go through these church history classes. And one of them is, is and this was kind of tough to me at first, uh, coming out of my background, was realizing that, you know, there really was no golden age of the church. That's kind of hard for us to swallow because we think, well, surely golden age, the apostolic age, you know, that surely that must have been that must have been as good as you can get it. You know, and we have our, our, our pictures of what that early church must have been. Uh, but, you know, right away they were having issues that they had to settle. Uh, there were things like Gnosticism and the Nicolaitan heresies. All these had to be settled. So right away from the get go, uh, the church has had to battle heresy and has had to stand up for the truth. Um, and a good pattern had been set, actually, by the apostles uh, that we read about in the book of Acts, uh, in that one of the ways that they solved this was a conciliar way, as in having a council, getting together as many church members as they could and having a council. So if you remember, they had one of the first councils in the book of Acts where they we're discussing about uh, having Gentiles join the church and what would be some important regulations to keep. Um, so that was one of the first and earliest ways that the early church started to deal with the problems because the early church had problems from day one. Hey, it's full of people like us, so it's going to, right? So as we'll find out, heresies abound during any time of the church age. And unfortunately, uh, I heard it said, well, it's kind of like a game if you're familiar with whack-a-mole. You, know, you whack one down and another one pops here. Then you whack that one down and another one pops up over here. So that tends to be how these heresies can go. Um, it's tough because uh, we, again, have some naivety in how this early church was set up. And we kind of just picture, well, wasn't everybody just basically sitting in a circle reading their Bibles and singing songs? Uh, but which kind of we picture it's almost like we had this idea that when John was on Patmos, he basically finished signing, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And then he turned to his assistant and said, Right, send this off to King James and Thomas Nelson, and we'll be good. No, it took a while for the Bible to come together. Uh, it, it, it took some doing. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, to even get, I, I heard this said, to even get one, like say you wanted the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians uh, duplicated for your church, that could cost as much as $5,000 in ancient times in real money just to have one of those scrolls reproduced. So scripture could be hard to come by. Uh, fortunately, they were a little bit more fortunate when it came to the Old Testament. Of course, as many of these early believers were believing Jews, so they had access to the Old Testament scriptures but it was a little bit more problematic when it came to the New Testament. So uh, 
a lot of times the church in its early years uh, relied on handing down apostolic truths. And Paul talks about that. He says, stand fast and, and hold on to the faith which was handed down to you, whether by a written apostle or by word of mouth. So it was very important to the apostles that people paid attention to what they were writing and paid attention to what they were saying. And these would help be correctives for the church. And if these heresies had one thing in common, and this was basically what our heroes helps fight against and fight for the answer, and that is the all important of who is Jesus. Because again, we want to make the gospel very simple, don't we? And you know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but we want to just have it as, as me and my Jesus, and can't that be good enough? Well, who is Jesus? What is Jesus? It's important to know these things so that you can know uh, what, what and who your faith is standing on. And I think that that is still a very valid question, even to today. So with that in mind, if we could go to the next slide, our story takes place in the Roman Empire, right around the time of 325 AD. This is the extent of it under the Emperor Constantine. Okay, so as you can see, it still spanned quite a long time. The, the decay had been temporarily halted. Uh, the Roman Empire was doing a little bit better. It experienced some tough times, but Constantine was able to unite it and to get it back on its feet a little bit. Uh, so this shows you the extent of the, uh, the area. And uh, Athanasius lived in Egypt and also a few other important people in our story lived in Egypt. And uh, eventually we'll make our way up to the city of Nicaea, which is right, if you look at, if you know where Turkey is on your map, if you look at right uh, where Bithynia is, right underneath of that is Nicaea. So those are gonna be two important places in our study. Yeah, there you go, there's Nicaea. Thank you, Chris. All right, if you go to the next slide. So events of the day, let's talk about them briefly. Again, I wanna make it brief because we don't wanna to get too bogged down with all this with all the, 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 the details that we can bring in here, because we can bring in a lot, and I'm a geek, so I can bring in a lot. So uh, just real quickly, the Edict of Milan had been issued. So Christianity is finally legal. After all these years, it's legal. It comes from Caesar himself. Finally, Paul's vision, if you remember, Paul had a vision he wanted, or he had a dream, and that was to bring the gospel even to the house of Caesar. Well, then it finally happened, and the Edict of Milan was issued, and Christianity was legal. However, you'd think everything would be great, but controversy overshadowed the freedom. Yep, there was problems in from the day one in the church, and there were still problems now. And this is when we see the rise of two different views. We see the rise of Arius and his views, and of Alexander and his views. And these guys were both bishops, and they both came from the African territories of the Roman Empire. Now, again, I want to make this a little bit fun, okay? Uh, so as we explore these people, we haven't quite gotten to Athanasius yet, but we will. But I want to make this a little bit fun. So uh, in history, it's really, I find it really helpful if you can assign a face to the person and if you can, so, sort of gives you a, a, a motion picture, a movie in your mind of what's going on, kind of make this a little bit more fun. So, Chris, if we could go to the next slide. We're going to talk about Arius, and then we'll get to who we're going to cast this Arius, okay? So, first, Arius was a dynamic speaker. He rose to prominence in North Africa, and he was famous for teaching that Christ was created. He was not eternal. Arius was famous for saying that there was a time when the Son of God was not. As a matter of fact, he was really good at this. He was really uh, just silver-tongued. He was great at uh, songs and little ditties, and he had a buzz all over the place that he was generating. And people were really paying attention to Arius and what he had to say. So let's go to the next slide. I'm going to steal a drink of coffee. Excuse me. Chris, are you there? He's there. Chris, are you there? 
Yep, it switched. Oh, okay. It went from it's to Alexander now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. My bad. I I thought I, I got my own slides out of order. Forgive me, folks. Historian jitters here. Let's talk about Alexander before we show who we picked to play the roles here. Uh, so let's talk about Alexander, the other guy, possibly of Jewish roots, born in Alexandria. Um, uh, he had a wit to him, and he had a a drive. He was very, very good at speaking. He was every bit as good as Arius. He was a renowned speaker. What Alexander taught was the same essence view of Jesus. He was fully God. Same essence. Now, if you really want to geek out, I'll give you the term. You're going to have to write it really quick. Homo usian. Homo usian. Same essence. Alexander taught that Jesus was consubstantial with the Father as to his divinity and consubstantial with us as to our humanity. So Alexander was out there doing everything he could to counter Arius, and he was actually pretty successful. So let's take a look at the next slide. Here's our Arius. Now, if you don't know who this guy is, you all are way more saved than I am, okay? This is Tom Hiddleston, and Tom Hiddleston played a character called Loki, the god of mischief, and I just thought it was such a perfect picture of who Arius was. The silver-tongued guy who could convince you round was square and square was round, and who could sell you any automobile he wanted, and he was very popular with everybody, was good-looking, plenty of charm, and he could just really get his way with an audience. But we also have Alexander that we want to picture, too. So who's our Alexander? Well, Alexander is none other than our Steve Herzig. Absolutely. Outgoing. Could easily captivate the crowd. Witty. And again, Alexander was quite possibly of Jewish ancestry. He had that Jewish knack of cutting him right to the issues. So Steve Herzig is starring as our Alexander of Alexandria. He responded to Arius's teaching, Arianism, with witty, exp ex witty responses and energetic sermons. You can just picture this guy saying, Arianism, Schmarianism, and just basically waving it off like that. So that's our, that's one of our heroes. And this well, another thing, if you ever work with Steve Herzig, you always know he's looking for the next generation of believers that he can recruit and get going out there. He wants the tight skinned fellas. I used to be a tight skinned fellow, not so much anymore. It's getting a little loose here, but he wants the tight skinned people. He wants to find a successor, he wants to get the truth out there. And he was so energetic, and so is our Steve Herzig. And he was looking for the next guy. And boy, did he ever find it in a guy called Athanasius. And who better to play the part of Athanasius than our own Chris Catulga? That's right. While uh, Athanasius was orphaned, he was extremely well-educated in matters theological. And like our Chris Catulga, he's an excellent speaker, able to command respect not just with his peers, but also with the older crowds. And soon it was clear for Alexander that Athanasius Chris was bound for great things. By the time our Athanasius was in his early 20s, he was already a, a deacon. He had written two books and had had them published. Uh, one was a defense against the uh, defense against paganism. Another was called On the Incarnation, which is actually a free book. If you Google On the Incarnation by Athanasius, and I'll be happy to give you that information later, you can actually download a PDF of that book. It's not that long. It's a fantastic read. So our Athanasius Chris was really ready to go, was on fire for the Lord, and was the perfect candidate, the perfect tight-skinned candidate uh, for our Alexander to pick as a successor. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So the lines are drawn because Arianism is spreading. Okay, and unfortunately, not every town was as fortunate as Alexandria was to have our Herzog Katulka duo of Athanasius and Alexander. Uh, there was great turmoil in the empire because of this. I mean, people were, the lines were like, no kidding, lines were being drawn. People were fighting. It was just a mess. And it was exactly the kind of mess that the emperor didn't want. He wanted harmony, he wanted peace. And 
he, according to Eusebius, wanted truth. He wanted to, this to be figured out too. So what was to be done? If we could go to our next slide. Well, they took their inspiration from the book of Acts. They remembered that the book of Acts had solved its first problems in a conciliar fashion. So a great council was planned. The council would be located basically in the center of the empire, trying to make it easy as possible for all the bishops, of which there was estimated to be 1,800, to be invited. Um, so Constantine planned out the council, sent out the invitation. Now, even with Roman roads, folks, travel was really difficult. As Alexander is looking over his invitation, He's realizing, you know, he's not getting any younger. The road's about 1,500 miles. There could, could be some rough time of traveling. And he looked over at uh, Athanasius there, who was all young and ready to go and energetic. And I can just picture him putting his hand on his shoulder and pushing him forward and saying, hey, kid, it's your time to shine. His trust was not misplaced uh, because Athanasius had making a name for himself and uh, was definitely the right person to send to the council at Nicaea. If we could go to the next slide, please. So we get to the council and we basically have our Athanasius Loki, I'm sorry, Arius Loki versus Athanasius Chris. So like two boxers in a, in a it, it, we kind of want to picture that, but it was a lot more polite than that folks. Okay, the council was well organized firstly, Bishops were invited all over, and a lot of bishops were invited to speak equally, including Arius. Um, Arius gave his arguments, um, and uh, this was so infuriating to a fanboy of Athanasius that this fanboy actually got up and gave Athanasius, I'm sorry, he gave Arius a, a sock in the mouth. Does anybody, well, I won't make you guess. The, the, uh, the, uh, the assailant of Arius was none other than Nicholas of Mira, who is one of the Athanasius fanboys. This Nicholas is none other than the St. Nicholas, who would be known later on as St. Nicholas the Gift Giver. So, you know, when they sing that song, you, you better watch out. You better not cry. It, it, you, yeah, you better not I'll tell you why Santa Claus is coming to town. You know, he, he came to town to bring presents and punch heretics, and he's all out of presents. So... That was a brief interlude that happened, and, and uh, Nicholas was, uh, was apprehended and made to calm down, and Arius was able to give his arguments in peace. And his point, again, was that Christ was a created being. Okay, this is very important to grab here. This is what he was saying. Christ was a created being. Uh, he, that there was a time, again, this was the famous Arian phrase, there was a time when the Son of God was not. A few other bishops got up, but nobody was really able to give a great argument intellectually and theologically until Athanasius, it was the turn of our Athanasius Chris. And he's going to prove more than a match, theologically and intellectually. He was able to stand up like our Chris. He was able to give a good sermon. And he was able to bring up points like this, that according to the scriptures and the teachings that had been handed down, Jesus Christ was indeed fully God and fully man. This meant that unlike Arius said, Jesus was not created. He was eternal. Okay. He was begotten, eternally begotten of the Father. Like I said, he made many arguments, but the chief one, and perhaps the simplest one to share here, and I'm going to give you what I want you to walk away with uh, as we're about two thirds through here. If you can hang on to one point from this, and there's a lot of information, that is the point of Athanasius was all of God's attributes are eternal. All of God's attributes are eternal. And I think we can all agree with that. And one of those attributes is his fatherhood. See, there never was a time when God was not the Father. He was eternally the Father. And if he was eternally the Father, he had to have eternally a son. So there never was a time 
when Jesus didn't exist. So again, all of God's attributes are eternal. This was the point of Athanasius, that there never was a time when the Father was not the Father. And by extension, Christ was never not the Son. Athanasius prevailed. See, Arius was appealing to human reason. I mean, we all want the incarnation to make sense. We don't want to have to make leaps. We, we don't, especially in the West, don't like mystery. But while Arius appealed to that human reason, Athanasius appealed to the scriptures, to the tradition, and he appealed to divine mystery, saying it was okay to not understand everything, that that wasn't a problem, that, that there were just some things that are hard to wrap your mind around. So it was okay for there to be mystery. Well, let's go to our next slide. Okay, so our Athanasius Chris was victorious. He countered all of Arius's arguments. He argued successfully that all of God's attributes are eternal. And he convinced everyone there, but Arius and two of the 300 bishops. So he was extremely successful in his arguments. Uh, and it was topped off by Constantine putting his, his seal of approval on it by sending Arius and the two bishops who disagreed into exile. Uh, can we go to our next slide? Happily ever after? Well, unfortunately, things aren't always so cut and dry. You see, there had been some intrigue in the palace between Arius and the sons of Constantine. And Arius had actually won over the sons of Constantine to his thinking. And within a couple of years, Constantine had actually passed from the scene. And his sons that came to power basically ushered in a new age of Arianism even bringing back Arius himself to be a bishop. And this became such a problem that the people who remained faithful to the teachings of Athanasius, including Athanasius himself, the faithful began to be persecuted for their faith. By this time, Alexander had passed away. So Steve's role in this is done, but Chris's role still continues as uh, Athanasius now became the bishop of Alexandria. But soon that church fell under persecution, and Athanasius himself would be exiled. Can we go to the next slide? So what we see in this wake is basically Athanasius Chris against the world because much of the empire reverted to Arianism. Athanasius was exiled. Plots were made against his life. Okay, so it really got serious here. Um, he was in mortal danger several times. Uh, but you know what he did? Just like our Chris would, I know he would, he kept on preaching. He kept on preaching the word. He kept on preaching the truth. And eventually, as we would see, he would turn the tables very wittily on our Aryan friends who tried for once and for all to shut this guy up. Basically, they generated a rumor and they cited that uh, uh, you can go to the next slide, I think. Yeah. His, so, yeah, we'll talk about the legacy in just a minute, but that's okay. We can be there right there. Um, so Athanasius was accused of witchcraft. There was a plot assembled against him. There was a person that they were, that these Arians claimed that Athanasius had cut off his right hand, had used it in witchcraft, and had killed the person afterwards and therefore should die for it. And so Athanasius was dragged to the courthouse. But Athanasius knew that something was, was really wrong here, and he was able to use his wit. And when it was his turn to testify, Athanasius motioned to a mysterious robed figure in the room, and the robed figure was brought forward. And Athanasius asked the figure to show his left hand, and he showed his left hand. And then he was asked to show his right hand, and he showed his right hand. And then basically our Athanasius Chris said, and for my next trick, and he took off the hood, and it was the very man that Athanasius was, was accused of killing and using for witchcraft. So apparently the Arians weren't very bright on who they chose to be the victim and weren't very thorough. So with that, finally, 
our hero Athanasius Christ was secure. His constant preaching began to spread. He could no longer be justifiably exiled for anything. And now he himself, remember those tight-skinned people, he began to raise up some of his own tight-skinned people to take up his mantle. So what's his legacy? Well, his legacies are some of those disciples that we talk about. There are many important writers, many important theologians that came from him. Our Athanasius himself wrote several influential books, including the book on the Incarnation, that helped guide the early church. And one of the things he actually did was sort out, and he did this during one of the times he was in exile, he finally sorted out problems in the New Testament canon. That's right, the New Testament that we have today, we actually owe to the work of Athanasius. He finally got it sorted out, was able to help rule out what books didn't belong and what books did belong and in what order they should be. We actually owe that to Athanasius. So I'd like to close by saying through Athanasius, I think we're reminded of how, not only just how vital it is to contend for the faith, I think we should also be mindful when we're tempted to judge ability by age. Paul himself says this in a verse that I want to leave us with, and that is in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, he says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in faith, in purity. Thank you all very much. 